In case you're a comic book fan and have been living under a rock, a few weeks ago some test footage from the long proposed Deadpool movie surfaced. Unfortunately, Fox has been taking down videos of the footage as fast as they go up, so I can't show it here. But what was shown in the footage actually looked pretty promising. Apparently, Blur Studios, the animation company behind countless video game cutscenes and the entire opening battle sequence of Thor Dark World is responsible for this footage. Hell, even Ryan Reynolds actually voiced Deadpool himself. This is great news for fans of the Merc with a Mouth. I mean, this movie's been in production hell for, what, five years now? It's about time we heard something, anything about the movie. And as far as the footage goes, it's pretty promising. It's funny, it's well made, and it really captures the spirit of Deadpool. And Reynolds does a great job voicing him. But, in a way, it actually sucks that this footage is so promising. Because this Deadpool movie... It's never going to happen. Let me clarify something first. I am by no means any kind of authority on the film industry or the inner workings of 20th Century Fox. In fact, I'd be hard pressed to describe myself as an authority on anything. My points are based on my own opinions, observations, and assumptions on the facts at hand. Am I wrong? Maybe. Could I be proven wrong in the future? I certainly hope so, but these are the facts as I see them. I actually do believe we'll get a Deadpool feature film in the near future. I mean, with the current popularity surrounding superhero films, how could we not? But if we do, I doubt very much it will be the Deadpool movie we want, and damn it, we deserve. My first point, the rating. First of all, let's take a look at who Deadpool is as a character. Created by Rob Liefeld and Fabian Nassiza, Deadpool first appeared in New Mutants number 98 in 1991. Wade Wilson, aka Deadpool, was a ruthless mercenary who hunted mutants. In his initial appearances, Deadpool was almost indistinguishable from the onslaught of gun-toting hitmen that were so prevalent in 90s comic books, and it wasn't until 1997 when he got his own ongoing series by Joe Kelly and Ed McGuinness that Deadpool became the character we know and love today. Since the creative team behind Deadpool were always expecting a cancellation for the series, they decided to just use whatever crazy ideas they had and go nuts with the character, effectively making the title a parody of so many dark and gritty superhero titles that plagued the 90s. This also turned Wade into a wisecracking, hyper-violent weirdo, and by extension, a pop culture icon. Part of Wade's allure was, and is, his over-the-top persona. The way he can have such a carefree and gleeful attitude while committing multiple homicides. You can see why this might present an issue for Fox. See, every post and article you find about a Deadpool movie will say the same thing. The movie should be, no, has to be, a hard R to include all the blood, guts, and crude humor that have become a staple of his character. And I agree, a Deadpool movie should be violent. A Deadpool movie without gratuitous violence would be like a Batman movie without punching, or an Iron Man movie without multiple costume changes, or an American Godzilla movie that isn't terrible. But that would be an incredibly risky move for Fox. In the film industry, there are four major demographics to appeal to males and females under 25 years old, and males and females over 25 years old. The basic idea is that when you release a film, it should appeal to at least two of the demographics or quadrants. A four quadrant film is one which appeals to every one of these groups. So in other words, to everyone. These would be your summer blockbuster films, your Pirates of the Caribbeans, your Harry Potters, your Avengers, and of course your X-Men's. X-Men films, X-Men's, it... These films are structured in such a way as to give viewers of all genders and ages something to enjoy. Now, regardless as to whether these assumptions about male and female interests are accurate is another discussion entirely. The fact is, the formula works, whether for the reasons assumed or not. That's how films make money. So what does this have to do with Deadpool? Well, if the Deadpool movie has an R rating, it will obviously limit who can get in to see the movie, and the film will not be able to be marketed to children under the age of 18. There goes most of your under 25 crowd. Considering how invaluable young audiences are to the success of superhero films, this would be a huge roadblock to overcome in terms of Fox making a profit. But hey, it's not like an R-rated superhero film has never been done before, right? Marvel Studios had the Blade trilogy early on, and don't forget about the Punisher films. Well, don't get too excited. The worldwide gross for each of the Blade films was 130 to 150 million each, and the Punisher only brought in 54 million, with Punisher Warzone bringing in a measly 10 million worldwide on a 35 million dollar budget. Ouch! 
In other words, without that younger audience to appeal to, R-rated superhero films just aren't profitable, especially when you compare those numbers to this summer's X-Men Days of Future Past, which surpassed 600 million worldwide just three weeks after its release. In other words, the stuff that makes Deadpool... Deadpool? is box office poison. In order to bring Deadpool to theaters and ensure a profit, Fox would either have to make a low-budget production, or water down everyone's favorite masked psychopath to make him more family-friendly. Pick your poison. My second point here? Ryan Reynolds himself. I think everyone can agree that Ryan Reynolds' portrayal of Wade Wilson, I refuse to call that Baraka thing Deadpool, was the best thing about X-Men Origins Wolverine. Not that it took much, admittedly. Still, Reynolds seemed like a perfect match for the character. So after putting the miserable bomb that was... Ugh, Green Lantern... behind him, it's no surprise that Reynolds has been one of the driving forces to get this Deadpool project off the ground. And I'm all for that! I loved him as Wilson in Origins. I even enjoyed him, and little else, in Green Lantern. Plus, his voice work in the test footage proves that he has the charisma and personality to carry the character without using his face. He's perfect! Right? Right? Well, Reynolds' involvement actually creates some problems. One of the problems is that Reynolds is too marketable. Let's face it, he's a good looking guy. In studios make use of that by putting him in roles where you can see his gorgeous, chiseled mug and use his face to sell tickets. Now, what's the one thing that Deadpool is always wearing? Oh yeah, a full face mask. He rarely takes it off, uh, he's a little uh, sensitive about his looks. It's such an integral part of the character, there is no way they could reasonably just write it out. I already said that's not, that's not Deadpool, it's Baraka, Baraka! Mortal Kombat. Consider an interesting point that Cracked writer Tom Raymond, Raymond, Ryman? Probably, it's, those are probably all wrong, makes in his article on superhero movies we will never see. He notes that for movies like The Amazing Spider-Man, The Incredible Hulk, and Iron Man, most of the screen time for the titular character consists of either CGI or stuntmen in costume. Meaning, the studio can therefore pay the lead actor substantially less money, since they technically have much less screen time. Hence the problem with Reynolds. Fox, already going out on a limb making the film, would likely not want to shell out a huge payday for Reynolds, meaning they would have to negotiate a smaller pay for him. And even then, Reynolds' appearance in the movie would essentially be limited to pre-Face Massacre Wade Wilson, meaning that his rule as Deadpool would likely end up being mostly voice work, which could mean negotiating an even smaller contract. You have to remember, filmmaking is a business. It's all about dollars and cents. And there's no way Fox is going to open their admittedly large wallet to a star who would barely be in the actual movie. Sorry, Ryan. I still love you, though. And my third point, the character himself. A lot of this has to do with things that I already touched on in the rating, but there's some specifics that I think are different enough that they belong in a separate point. Let's face it, Hollywood films and superhero films in general are formulaic. They star a white male hero who starts off hot-headed and brash, who, over the course of the movie, finds what it means to be heroic within himself and rises up to help others and defeat the bad guy who is now in some way responsible for making him who they are! Oof. Like I said before, the reason a formula exists is because it works. Mostly. See, in order to make Deadpool a character that people could relate to, they would have to make him into one of those cookie-cutter characters, even though that flies in the face of what people love about him. Think about it. Wouldn't it be difficult for an uninitiated moviegoer to root for an amoral psychopath? It's not like this would be a television show like Breaking Bad or Dexter, where there's plenty of time to explore the gray areas of what the characters do and contemplate the morality of their decisions. It's not something Deadpool would do anyway. He's an impulsive bag of swords, bullets, and one-liners, and that's just the way we like it. But that's a niche appeal at best. The argument is always made that fans of the character would support the movie, but that's not how movies make money. Look at the comic sales for Deadpool for this year alone. Deadpool number 27, the highest selling issue so far this year, made a little over 62 grand, which is about the best most titles can hope for. Even Batman, the consistent leader of the pack, makes between 100 and 130,000 every month. If we divide Deadpool's average sales, 48,919, by 399, the price of the comic, we can see that about 12,260 issues were sold. If we assume each issue is one person and multiply this number by the price of a 3D movie ticket, 
The box office gross from fan support alone for a Deadpool movie is a little over $180,000. This is my very long-winded way of saying that fan support alone can't get a film off the ground. The character has to be altered to allow him to appeal to unfamiliar viewers, and hence there is no way the studio would ever greenlight a film with a protagonist that only a fraction of their demographic could relate to, or at least be familiar with. But wait, I hear you saying, which is weird because I... I mean, I shouldn't be able to hear that. Wolverine is a psychopathic anti-hero, and Fox made him work on the screen. And I can't disagree with that. But they also really played up Logan's heroic side to make this fit. Still, the changes made to the adamantium raging killer we know from the comics weren't as drastic as the ones that would need to be made to Deadpool. Suffice it to say, there's a reason he ended up being the villain in X-Men Origins. He's just not heroic. And that's not a bad thing. Well, at least from the point of view of a comic fan, from the perspective of the studio, it would be hard to justify. And a bonus point! This one isn't so much an objective obstacle or a road bump in terms of production, it's just something I personally have a problem with and that I think would really hinder the film. More of a personal gripe than anything else. For as long as this film has been talked about, reports have surfaced that Rob Liefeld, one of the quote-unquote creators of Deadpool, will be involved with the production. Sounds good, right? Why wouldn't you want one of the people who created the character to be involved with making him more appealing to the general public? Well, I don't want it. I don't want Rob Liefeld to be involved with the movie. I don't like him. If you think Liefeld being involved with anything sounds like a good idea to you, you may not know exactly who he is. For those who don't, Rob Liefeld was a comic writer slash illustrator who worked for Marvel in the 1980s and early 1990s before leaving to form Image Comics with other than Marvel writers and artists. Liefeld is notorious for putting out some of the worst illustrated and worst written comics in the history of the medium. Rob Liefeld must have grown up near some laboratory where scientists attempted to use radioactive pouches to grant sentience to balloons filled with meat. It's my only explanation to what could have inspired him to create so many characters with such ridiculous appearances and so little personality. All of his characters are essentially the same muscle-bound, gun-toting badass, just with different headwear. As I stated before, it wasn't until writers like Joe Kelly took hold of the character that Deadpool became unique and interesting. In Liefeld's hands, Deadpool was just another mercenary. In fact, he was a near-carbon copy of the DC character Deathstroke, a title which Liefeld actually ended up writing for recently. Brilliant decisions as always, DC. Basically, it's my opinion that Rob Liefeld is the wrong person to have involved with the project. Unless Fox wants to make Deadpool watered down and boring, as I suggested they might, in which case, maybe Rob Liefeld's the perfect person to have involved. They still get made, right? So, what do you think about the Deadpool movie? Is it doomed to the eternal torment of production hell, or the long-lasting shame of a crappy adaptation? Am I just a stupid guy? Hair. Microphone. Am I way off? Did it hit the nail on the head? Let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to Panel Smasher Studios for more videos like this in the future. For now, this has been Pop Culture Ego. Thanks for watching. Well, we've learned a lot about Deadpool today. If you want to learn some cool facts about the Guardians of the Galaxy, click right here. Or if you can't get enough on my face and want to see it used to make an awesome carnage mask, that's a weirdly specific option too.